All right, so this is the part two video for lecture series for week 11. Um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, common issues with UVing and texturing um, that I've seen with uh, the project two. So UVing, um, you know, when you, when you bring a, an asset into a game, you have a file that's going to represent the 3D model. Basically, all, where, all these vertices, how they lie out to create this surface, this 3D object. Um, <clears throat> and then you have these texture files, which basically tell you what the texture should look like, how the diffuse, the color should look like on this object, how the specular, specular highlights should look like across the object, and the normal map, which is, actu which is adding extra, extra surface details that aren't in your mod in your geometry. So UVs tells the the 3D program like Maya or the game engine like Unity how to apply a 2D surface, a 2D plane, and wrap it and or apply it to this 3D object. With, so you'll get something like this, where instead of just a plain gray object, you actually get a texture applied to it, a color information, and then again, specular normal we'll get into later. So UVing is a process of taking this 3D object and explaining how to lay out its parts into a 2D grid so that you can apply a texture onto it. So the best way to think about UVing is just one part at a time. So you do have a planar, cylindrical, spherical, and automatic, which is basically like a big box, six planes around it. So basically, you look at each, just like as you modeled, you started with primitive, you looked at an object and you figured out, okay, I can make, I can start from a box, a cube here, a cylinder here, a sphere here to create this. You're gonna start with a primitive shape to create your UVs. Um, so the head, actually this, um, I can look at this sledgehammer and say that this whole handle um, is actually a cylinder. And this head is a cylinder. They're just oriented differently. You can see that... Um, you could say that the... That you see that... Just scale this up. That the handle actually is almost a cylinder. And the head could almost be seen as represented as a cylinder also. And that gets you close, and then you're gonna have to work a lot with the UVs. But you basically go through that process that we do, that were in Chris's videos and also in the canned mushroom videos. But even if it's just one object, there's not many different parts of the geometry, it's one piece of geometry, you can still select faces and say I'll take the handle and I'll apply a cylinder UV to that and then I'll select the head and I'll do him separately and do a cylinder for him. In fact if you look at this you can see that here's the um, end cap of one head of the hammer, here's the other end cap. This whole thing here is the um, I actually unwrapped as a cylinder. Oh, you could also do it automatic. There's actually, he's almost like a big cube also. So it, it really, it just comes down to your preference and um, actually just a lot of experience to understand the best way to unwrap it. And you can see the cylinder here. He's just completely unwrapped. And here's um, each section up, going up. And so here you have in my UV space the entire hammer. Here's the head of the um, the tip of one head, the tip of the other, the base of the head, and here is the handle all broken out. And the, the trick is you want to maximize use of this UV space. You see there's very little empty space. I really scaled everything up. And you know, there's that whole process. You apply the checkerboard pattern onto this object so that um, 
you can see if there's any stretching or distortion and where you have to think about where you want to place your seams because when you unwrap a 3D object if I select this edge right here and I free up on it, um, zoom up on it, sorry um, you see that um, there's a, a seam. You see that this checker pattern doesn't come over onto this side. You see there's, a, there's like a seam, a cut. It's like if you wrapped paper around this, you tried to like gift wrap it, it would start at this seam and wrap all the way around and end up here again. So this is a seam <coughs> where it'll be a break in your texture and it'll be visible and you're gonna wanna hide them. You see I have them on the underside of the hammer. Let's see where this seam is. I'll zoom up on him. You see I kind of placed him um, <clears throat> on like the underside where I think that um, if you're, you know, you're swinging the hammer, you'd be seeing the hammer from this side. So I'm kind of hiding the seam. And again, I placed the seam up as I unwrapped it. And you see that all the squares are pretty much even. No distorted squares and they're all pretty much the same size. So that is the big... Um, the big thinking that goes into UVing, and you can see I placed a seam <clears throat> around the head, but as I apply the texture, I did this on purpose because, oh, which one is it? One second. Um, now, here we go. I did this, I, I intentionally placed a seam here because there's going to be actually a different material. The whole head was going to be this green metal, the base of the head, and the tips here are actually going to be like a more raw metal without paint on it. So that actually makes sense to have a seam there. And you can see I have a different metal on the, the tips of the head as I do on the base here. And I actually, I intentionally broke up the handle because the the green metal was coming down onto this part more, and so, so I moved him over here, so it made sense that I just had this green texture applied on this whole area, and the rest is this kind of yellow, bumpy uh, rubber with the handle here. And you can see that my little seam here, um, but again, usually you're going to be seeing it from this side, so it works out pretty well. Um, so I noticed some of you... Um, we're kind of grabbing maybe sections of your UVs and moving it, and you're saying, hey, what's this stretching that's going on? And um, if you want to move it away, <laughs> again, you got to use these kind of cut and sew tools. You, you, you'll use this, um, these primitive mappings, and then you're going to cut and sew them up to um, make your final UV shells. So basically a shell is if I select some UVs here and I control right click I can go to shell. Um, also you can go select shell. Basically a shell is a section of the UVs that are independent of other UVs. You can move them by themselves. In fact they're corresponding to this section and as I move it you see it's inheriting texture information from where I move it around. Um, but it's not causing stretching. But if I just grab a section of a UV shell and move it, you see I'm going to get stretching here. You see as I'm screwing up the texture on the head here. <clears throat> so again, you either go to shell to move the whole shell without stretching, or if you wanted a series of this and you want to cut, you go into edge mode. Or you could select the UVs that you wanted. Like if I want to cut here, you can say um, select convert selection to edges. It'll select the edges. It's a little selecting more than I want though. Go in, and I can go into edge mode and control select those off. But let me just select them manually and I could use the cut tool or under here polygons cut and what happens then is if I select the UV and I go to shell 
now I have a smaller island. And you see it's corresponding to this little section here. So I kind of cut along that edge and created two UV shells. So now there's no stretching. And if I want to sew them back up, I would move them as close as I can. And then I have here the move and sew tool. I would select here and here and polygons, sew UVs. Oop, I select, you gotta be careful what you select. So I'm just going to select the actual edges here. See, the problem was I selected this edge here. Like if I sew it, it's going to move it over here because actually that edge corresponds to an edge up here. If I hide my image, okay, it corresponds to this edge. So you see that one edge corresponds to another one uh, if I frame up on it. And that's where one UV set ends another begins so if I select one UV here frame up on it here we go here's the UV now you actually it's the you got you have several edges touching basically for each vertex there's one UV there and so you have four edges basically touching this one UV. So what happens is when you rip stuff apart, so on the edge of your UV islands, you have this edge, but also corresponds to this edge up here because these faces are sharing an edge. So if I zoom up, see it's this edge here, but this face here and this face here is sharing it. Um, so you have to, when you're sewing it, stuff together, you're going to select the border edges. Even if you select edges that are already sewn together and you click it, it won't do anything. So that's why I can like select multiple edges and sew. And then what happens is I can go to shell and now it's one big shell again. You just have to be careful what border, what border edges you select. See, if I select these, actually this edge is corresponding up here this edge up here. So if I select these two and click move and sew, it's going to try and figure out the best it's going to move it, and try and figure out how to sew it together. So that's why you want to move your stuff as close as possible um, before sewing it. So that's the basics that you want to cut and sew and basically put a checkerboard pattern on your object and really um, scale everything so that all the checkerboard, so that all the checkers are the same size. Um, and there's no, and you're hiding your seams and there's very little distortion, meaning weight, like waviness. So if I, um, grab some UVs here and I move them, you see, I'm getting some weird distortion in there. These squares are not perfect squares anymore. All right. And then the end result, meaning you take these UVs, you do a polygon UV snapshot, you can bring them into Photoshop. And then you create textures. Since I created these UVs, I know that this is the head of the hammer and I want a green metal on it. I know that these were the tips. I wanted this type of beat up metal and I know that this is a handle. You know, and then I use the UVs as a guide. I turn them off and I just have my bare texture and you can save this out and then apply it. Now a quick way, um, So there are two texturing methods. Um, I wanted, there was a little confusion. When I taught you um, concepting, I basically told you how to grab images online, right? And then, um, you know, with your UVs on, you'd, you'd know which areas you need to texture. And you would grab, like, images. You would scale them, rotate them you know, make them fit the area. Do what you need to do to make this texture apply onto your UVs correctly. Basically, you're um, doing what I taught you um, in the concepting in project one. You grab textures, you move them over here, and then you do some additional um, Photoshop work or other textures and you, you layer them on top of each other to get dirt and grime and blood and whatever. But then Chris taught you another way in his videos where he took the this substance 
um, basically from Maya were these like procedural materials uh, like you know it's great for making real basics like glass and wood and metal and stone and tile and this and that right and then you'd like you, you're happy with how it looks on applied onto your object all you have to do UVs first and then you'd bake it out and it would create a 2d version of it a flat 2d version you could bring it into Photoshop manipulate it a little bit more maybe add some dirt grime or whatever so you can do either one if you're comfortable, you really like this substance materials in Maya to create your initial materials and then um, bake out the textures, which basically creates a flat 2D you know, representation that you can edit in Photoshop and that would be your texture file. Or you, know, you grab your UVs, you pop them into Photoshop, you find some, fo some photo references on cgtextures.com, on FilterForge, whatever. Um, and then you, you scale them. I mean, basically, the end result is you're getting back into Photoshop, you're tweaking, you're, you're adding more levels of detail on them. It's basically just creating 2D versions of textures. So you can use Chris's method where you use Substance and Maya, or my method where you just grab textures online. I, mean, I just wanted to show you Filter Forge real quick. Um, Filter Forge, go to Filters. This is a pl Photoshop plugin. But this is a user library. Basically, people load up their stuff. And you can search on stuff. Like, I'll search on Rust. And I'm not interested in their actual filters. Say if I really like this one. I'm interested in his actual textures he created. So down here at the bottom, I have my diffuse, bump, normal. Usually, they'll have a spec also. I'm not interested in bump, but I'm really interested in normal. This is really awesome. They already have the normal map generated. And you click on all these different variations if you like these better. And you can um, see that it makes a seamless texture. Um, so that means that this image can be tileable over and over again. So it, basically they create tileable images and a lot of them already have their normals and spec. That's what I wanted to show you about FilterForge. Um, so either way, the ultimate line, um, thing is you create nice clean model geometry, you create nice clean UVs using the checkerboard to check for distortions seams and that all your texture spaces are the same size and that you maximize your use of this UV space. Um, and yes, the textures tile outside of this space, but in the game engine they won't. So stick within this space. And then you, you, you use Chris's method or my method, basically get the UVs out and you start modifying your textures more in Photoshop. And then either you, you save out, basically you hide your guide layer, so you get rid of UVs, and you save out like a JPEG or a PNG, and then you're going to connect them in here. What I didn't want to say is, um, you know, you create a Lambert or whatever, and you're going to connect it up. If you create a PNG or something that might have an alpha mask in it, um, Maya tries to be a little smart, but it's not really being that smart. So what it... What I'm trying to say is, um, if I bring back the texture material, um, you might connect in, you might create a blend or something and connect in the color channel, right, to your material. And if it's um, a PNG or a Targa or something, it'll actually take this transparency channel and connect it to the alpha channel of your texture. So there's RGBA, red, green, blue, alpha. Alpha is in my previous video where I showed you you're going to shove your spec map in there when you go into the game engine. But even if you don't have a spec, uh, an alpha channel, it'll actually connect this transparency to it and you'll get like a weird semi-transparent object. So just right click on transparency and there'll be like this break connection. Like here, if I right click on color, I right click on color, break connection. See it actually, now transparency got connected, right click, break connection. So just be aware that, that if you have a, this weird semi-transparent object, just break the transparency. Um, I also want to say when you create a material, you can actually connect directly to the Photoshop file instead of like saving out a Targa, PNG, or JPEG. Um, you can actually connect right into the Photoshop file. Um, and 
And what's cool about that is you'll, you'll see your texture. You don't like it. You might modify something. All you do is file, save, save out your Photoshop file, jump back into Maya, and your, your um, updates will be reflected. If not, just go into the color channel and click reload. But then you don't have to like save out, keep saving out JPEGs or PNGs out of Photoshop. You just connect your Photoshop file directly in. And you don't like something, you change it in Photoshop, file, save in Photoshop, come back into Maya. It should reload automatically. If it doesn't, again, just click in here and click reload on your file. Um, I wanted to talk about Crazy Bump. So, once you have your, your texture, your, your diffuse channel that you're happy with, um, you can use programs like the NVIDIA plugin for Photoshop or the PixPlant that we uploaded. Um, for your Mac users, both of those don't work. So I'm actually really like Crazy Bump. It's crazybump.com. You can get the 30-day trial, or if you really like it, I paid $50 to get the educational version. So you open photo from a file. Um, and let me... navigate to my diffuse map it calls sledgehammer modern okay it's this one this is my color channel um what's really cool is basically you're, you're you're just trying to specify your normal map at this point. So this is saying like my handle here is kind of pushing out and here it's pushing in. So basically I'm, I'm trying to specify, um, and you notice here on my, my tip of my head is kind of like dented in here. It's pushed out here and dented. It's kind of like uh, the reverse. It's like, do you, um, it's trying to say which way do you want your normal map to be created. Um, it doesn't matter because you can change this later, but I'll pick this one. And so this is kind of showing my normal map on a sphere, um, but you can click a column or, or anything else um, to try. In fact, since my thing is very cylindrical, I'll pick this kind of cylinder. Um, and you see it's kind of denting in the black rubber. This is the yellow rubber. Here's the, the head. Um, actually, the black rubber should be pushed out a little bit. So here's my normals this is what normals look like um, I can actually flip it um, intensity negative 50 I just flipped it all right here's invert actually let me go back to 50 I'll invert the shape recognition and then I'll go back to my object Uh, show 3D preview, and now you can kind of see as I move around, this is kind of pushed out. So you'll get a lot um, done, um, but you're going to have to tweak this a little bit. Maybe I really like this area pushed out, but maybe the head up here I didn't like. Maybe I liked it the reverse way. So maybe I, I would save, you could save this normal map out, and maybe I'd invert it, and I'd save it out also, and I'd have two normal maps. And I'd use this section up here, and then I would, uh, from the other normal map, like use this section. So you can like mess around a lot. You know, you can try all these different effects: sharpen, noise removal, shape recognition. You you'll get a lot of different um, effects. And again, you just show 3D Mixer to take a look and see how the normal map's looking. Um, displacement, don't worry about. Occlusion might be kind of cool. Uh, ambient occlusion, I'll get in this is a second. So this is kind of fi trying to figure out um, how the, like this object would create shadows on itself. Like you could save this out and you could see that you could bring this in with your diffuse map and use the multiply layer and kind of darken certain areas um, based on your texture. And that's not always the best option. So I'm going to show you how to actually bake out ambient occlusion from your geometry in mind in a second. But I want to show you specularity. So this creates a specular map. Again, the black is like not highly specular. White is very highly specular. So again, maybe I want to invert it. 
you know, and maybe grab us this section, this section from the other one. But again, like now it's creating maps for me. You know, I can mess around with all these values to influence. And, it's a, and you know, you, you'll have to experiment a lot, plug it into Maya, right? You got the blend, you got the color. Uh, down here is specular color. This is where I plug in my spec map. Here's bump, map, bump mapping, sorry. Um, when it does create it, it plugs into a file. You, you create up here, it'll create this bump node. Just make sure it's tangent space normals. Very important to be able to understand it better. Um, it'll read it, tangent space normals there. Um, so you have your color, bump mapping, specular color. Again, bump map. I'll click here, I'll click here again. I'm in my bump node. Make it tangent space normal. Um, and again, you could create like three Photoshop files. One's your spec map, one's your diffuse map, one's your normal map. And then you could plug all three Photoshop files into each, the bump, you know, the spec and the color, and then, you know, modify them. I would really request hammering out your color map as best is like this like unbelievably this is perfect this is what I love then you know test one just start testing the bump map or just start testing the spec map and really look around move the create a light and move the light around move around see how the specular highlights are hitting and everything um, <clears throat> and then if you really love your specular map that's great because I'm telling you you're gonna have to create a few different specular maps you have to cut them up and piece them together in Photoshop and also some areas um, you're like, whoa, you know, this specular normal is not right at all. I want it to be flat. A great example is like the front of a sign that has writing. You don't want that writing to have like a depth feel to it. So you're going to want to put like, create like a flat color over your sign front, you know, to kill the normal map. Or like if that sign is just made out of a, t a rumply tin or whatever, you know, you want to kill the lettering on it. <clears throat> before you plug it into these type of programs. But anyway, that's how you can get your normal, your spec map. Um, I want to talk about baking out your ambient occlusion. So ambient occlusion is the process of um, self-shadowing. So in the little crevices, like way up in here, um, you know, you, there'll be like a lot of more shadowing here than like on the top of the hammer, because the top of the hammer has no like surrounding surfaces geometry to block light from t hitting it. Although under here, you know, there's it's kind of hidden. You got uh, light has to kind of bounce up into here, and so there's going to be some more shadowing. So you can kind of try and figure that out by creating a um, ambient occlu uh, occlusion render. Um, and if you click your object and let's see, batch bake, mental ray. Okay, yeah, you're gonna use this. So basically you wanna apply, let's create, assign a new material. Um, we wanna use this surface shader here and the out color here, we're gonna click on him. We're gonna want a mental ray material called ambient. I can search on ambient. MIA ambient occlusion. If this mental ray stuff is not showing up, you're going to have to go to window, settings and preferences, plugin manager, come on down and find mental ray. Here we go. Maya 2 mental ray. Maya 2 MR. Find that. Make sure you click on loaded and auto load. It has to load in because it's a plugin. But anyway, that's how you get mental ray to show up. Search on ambient occlusion. Here you get MIB ambient occlusion. The more of these samples, the higher it is, the more clean your shadow, the less bumpy it um, kind of like pixelated it is. So remember, you have to go powers of two, which is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. Usually 128 is really good. If it's still a little grainy, usually that's good because even if it is a little grainy, you could up just blur it slightly in Photoshop using the blur filter. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur, very slight blur. But usually 128 is good. You could try 256, but that's pretty much all you have to change here in the samples. So you got my material set up. Um, and rendering, if I click render settings, make sure you delete any lights in your scene. You don't want lights. You can even come in here under render options and turn this off. 
enable default lighting just you don't want lights um, this is like figuring out its own with this material placed on it. it's gonna it doesn't want lights so anyway go to rendering lighting and shading batch bake mental ray click on the box here objects to bake selected are all usually just you know, there's one object in the scene or whatever selected bake to texture um, single object. Yeah, I'm just messing around with just one object right now. But bake shadows. Camera doesn't matter. Um, you could say use bake override. Uh, I don't. I'm not interested in color. I only want the. I'm just getting the shadows only. Light. You can call it whatever. Baked AO. Baked ambient occlusion. But make your resolution whatever your texture size is. Five twelve, ten twenty four. 2048, whatever your texture size is. File format, the JPEG, whatever. Bake to one map, sure. UV range, just saying bake it within the UV space. You need your UVs laid out to bake out your ambient occlusion. Um, and that's it. And it's going to bake it into the folder um, that you had that your project set to. So I'm going to pause it and bake it. All right, so it baked out. Here it told me where. Here's my drive, my folders. And actually, be very specific, here's the project folder. It actually bakes out to render data, mental ray, light map, and then there's that name I gave. So if I go over here, and I go to render data, mental ray, light map, my baked AO, and he's black. So let me... Bake it out again. Let me find what the settings should be. Hold on a second. All right. So I was able to bake it out. Um, the issue was I had to have it on light and color here. So every time you bake it out, it'll actually like create a Lambert and apply it, um, the material onto it, so that you can see what your results are. So basically, it's a white Lambert, and you can see the shading that's going on. It's shading the underside of the hammer. And not so much on the top, and then like these groove areas. So I can open up the the baking, and you can see it's all white, white, white. It's just kind of dark here at the top of the handle, and it's dark at the bottom of the head where the handle meets. And actually, I took a render too. Like this is how I taught you, if you remember in the arch architecture class. This is just the ambient occlusion render from the camera view, that so that you could see kind of where that darkness would lie out. Um, but anyway, it actually applied a material onto it. Um, so if you like apply this process, you don't like it, you actually have to go back. See, I actually did it like 16 times to figure it out. But here's the surface shader. You got to keep going back to the surface shader and then set up this, right, selected texture, single object, big shadows. Um, you want to do the override so that you have access to here, do light and color surface front for normal direction name your file and your resolution x and y bake to one map that's basically it and it bakes out to here render data mental ray light map and here it is so what what do you do with this um well i can bring in my color information this is my diffuse map i'm just going to drag in my my um ambient occlusion. I actually, for speed's sake, I was doing it at um, 512, which is not a big deal. I can, I'm just, I'll just um, enlarge it. But this is why you bake it out, you know, at the size of your texture, so you don't have to do the scaling. But anyway, what you do is you, you bring in, you bring it to the top and um, layer and you do a multiply. Well, what did that do? It doesn't seem like much. Yeah, we have a lot of black, but if you look around here, especially here, it actually placed a black hole, but you can see it darkened here, here too. It was like, those were the only two areas that um, got darkened. So basically it applies a shadowing effect. Um, more complicated objects you could see it better. Um, <clears throat> in fact, if you look at, uh, I believe it was Robert 
Fogart's train, you could see, uh, like, I, I went through this process with him, and if you look at his uh, texturing, you can see um, here, here's this texture here. You can see the shadowing going on. And this is um, the top of this big cylinder tank, and it's all shadowed. That's because it's sitting right underneath this guy. Um, and the wood sitting on top, you know, underneath him, he has dark shadows. And little areas that have a lot of stuff around them got shadowed out. So it adds a level of realism. You can see, like, the hammer um, will have this type of shadowing, even on top of their diffuse map. Just be careful when you're creating your specular normal map. Usually you want to turn that off because that's going to influence. It's going to make like deeper, you know, more, more stronger influence than your normal spec map. It's, you should just turn that off when you're going to go into crazy bump or whatever. But this adds a nice level of detail onto your um, <clears throat> texture map. <clears throat> and that self-shadowing really provides a grounding. It really looks more of a solid object. So you should definitely do that process. Um, is that basically explained? Yeah, plugging everything back into Maya. Yeah, the PNG file creates transparency. But yeah, great. So I just wanted to show you some more objects and how they get kind of um, <clears throat> filleted out, you know, with the UVing process. Um, so that was the sledgehammer, pretty straightforward. Um, I'll show you the police car. <clears throat> Oh boy, he's got a lot of stuff going on in this scene. Let me just delete some stuff out. Okay. So there's a police car uh, made for like a zombie game. So if I take off the textures, uh, you can see the geo underneath. I turn on the wireframe. Uh, it was like 4,500 tries. Um, I'll put on the, the UVing. Basically, the whole main body of the car, I kind of did like a cylinder unwrap. So you can kind of see like he was kind of filleted out. Oh, also check out um, Nicholas Johnson's UV plugin, which he put up on the Tech Help. Uh, you can also check out Roadkill. It's a free UVing tool um, if you're having issues with UVing. Uh, but usually take it one step at a time. So like the tire, I would unwrap the tire, each one. Um, if you have multiple objects that are identical, you can think ahead. Like when you're modeling out a tire, oh, I'm going to use it four times. Let me unwrap it and then duplicate it out. Because you can create objects, unwrap the UVs and combine them, and they'll keep all their UV information. Then you'll move them around. In fact, that's how you're going to handle more tech complex objects. It's this police car always many objects like the view lamps the side view lamps the um lights on top the tires the trunk and what have you um the ramming stuff up front here and i would unwrap them deal with them separately in fact you know there's two of these i'd make one unwrap it move them over and then you combine them to other objects and you just kind of scale and maneuver the and rotate their uvs and fill out this uv space as best you can um, so here are the side view lamps right here. You know, very complicated. I kind of figured out where I want my scene to be underneath. Start with some type of unwrapping, maybe an auto unwrap or a cylinder, and just keep unwrapping it. These are the door handles. Here's the light on top. Here's the grill. These guys are here. And the whole car was just kind of filleted out, like you would fillet a fish or something. Because I didn't want, I wanted to minimize the seams on him. Because, um, uh, you know, it's the main car. It's really getting nice um, smoothness is, is essential. Uh, and then I can turn on high quality mode and you can see, you know, like the normal map and the uh, spec map on top of it. All right. Um, 
let me switch projects and I'll just show you the uh, the press cutter and the chain leg fence part of uh, raindrop All right, so this is the uh, press cutter, just a big machine. Let me turn off his texture. So again, he was many different objects. I mean, these are cylinders up here. This was a, you know, a box rounded off his top. Um, this started off as the bottom part by himself. You know, the hose modeled out. All these things inside here were all by themselves. And I dealt with one at a time. You know, I modeled this one like hexagonal thing, unwrapped him duplicate them out six times same with everything else start combining them up and then you combine up the pieces of geometry and then you start you know pushing everything into their uv space moving it around um, so you can identify like this rounded box thing here is this thing right here all these little pa paddle things is these right here and this is the whole bulk of the machine. I, I, I didn't want to see him going down the, the front of it. So the whole front is connected. And then the sides right here are, are connected right there and there for over here. I didn't want any seams in the front. So I placed all the seams the underneath. There's no bottom. And the seams all are in the back here because he just goes right up against the wall. And so up here, this kind of whole this cylinder thing here with holes in it that's what this thing is here and you can kind of identify all the parts this cube over here is this and so let me I'll turn on the um, texture and you can kind of see how this texture gets applied onto this object um, then high quality mode See if, I don't know if I have the normals plugged in or not. Yeah, I do. I have the spec map and the normals plugged in. Um, and again, you know, this spec is, is high overall, and I'm not really interested in that. I'm just seeing how the spec of the map plays with the normal map. And if the, you know, because I can always plug everything into the game engine and, you know, lower the overall specular influence um, and then I think there was a chain link fence all right so here's the um, fence asset um, I was taking renders so I had basically this background image to see like what it would look like in the uh, broken down lot but um, let me take the textures off and so Basically, you can see that um, uh, it's all cylinders, and I used planes with with alpha masks, um, transparency masks, to get the chain links. And that's a very common thing in video games because the geometry needed to get these chain links would be way too high. So you see that um, there's like barbed wire coming along the top here. And it's actually just a plane, flat 2D plane, um, with just an alpha cut in, so it looks like uh, chain link, or barbed wire, sorry, so barbed wire and the chain link, you know, I'll turn the, um, the wireframe on also. Uh, let me get rid of cameras. Let me get rid of this background so it might be easier for you to see. And I got the, the wireframe on so you can see that it's actually, I just have a transparency on for the barbed wire and the chain link. And they're just planes. So the real details in the posts and the locks, what have you. So let me turn that, that off. So anyway, it's like a rusted out fence. Um, and uh, these are just cylinders. I mean, the planes, the flat planes, are just an automatic mapping for a flat planar. And the poles are just a lot of cylinder unwrap. So it's just a lot of poles. And everything's just got a beaten up, rusted texture on it. Um, I can turn on high res, see if... Yeah, okay. 
So here's look like with the normal map and the specular map on it. So anyway, give you some ideas of different objects and how the textures influence them. So definitely do that ambient occlusion trick to get that self-shadowing into your diffuse map layer and then really think about how what what your specular map and normal map should be and then you basically manipulate your diffuse map save that out bring that into crazy bump or something like that to create your normal map and spec map and you might have to make a few um adjustments um you know get, kick out a few different normal maps and spec maps and piece them together and then plug everything in as photoshop files into maya into the diffuse spec and, and bump mapping and, and play with the photoshop files and save them out and go back and forth a lot and then um that's how you're really going to do a lot of troubleshooting and, and get a really high quality asset into the video game and then obviously plug everything into unity rebuild your materials and adjust your specular highlights strengths um <clears throat> And you should be on your way to getting uh, an asset into the Wasteland Game Engine. So if you have any other questions, you know, shoot me some emails, send me your projects, whatever, and um, I can help you fix your projects up. Thanks.